Well, at least you can hear me. Just let's start. Before we start maybe the most interesting interview of the day, I would like, to, I would like you to remember two years ago where we were. I mean, most of you were here already. Now, two years later, we're still here. We're here because we are friends and people who succeed to keep the, the spirit of our industry. And I would like to thank, especially today, two of my friends, the people who are the founder and organizer of the WAS, Dominique and Gina. Thank you, Gianna. Thanks. OK, now try to clean up your mind. Just go back when you were a teenager. Just forget your mobile, your text messages, what would be the dinner tonight, whatever. Just try to figure out when you were a teenager. At that time, I had a dream from my side. It was maybe to be one day in the space. Today, we have the honor to, work, to, uh, to welcome someone who is maybe one of the 500 people who went to the space. The person went from zero kilometers per hour up to 28,000 kilometers per hour. He used to do 60 times, he went six times around the earth in one day, which is quite amazing. 60. 16. 16, amazing. It's what, one hour and a half minute to, to yes. make one tour around the Terre. And this person, I'm so glad, is with us today. It's General Michel Tonini, one of those French, whatever you call it, cosmonauts, passionauts, astronauts, taikonauts also. But in France, we say what? Astronauts? Today, astronauts. Astronauts. So welcome, Michel. Thank you. And uh, thank you to invite me to this uh, wonderful place to go to space. And today we're going to share, I'm going to share with you what it is to go to space and a little bit of history of space and a little bit about uh, what we do to take the new astronaut of the new generation. I call them astronaut 2.0. And at the end, obviously, you can ask all the questions you want because we have a little bit of time today. So all the secret questions, don't hesitate to ask me. Um, I will be both glad to, to answer to you. At the beginning, I was a pilot, a fighter pilot. I flew the Mirage, um, mainly the Mirage F1. Then I became a test pilot, so I flew all the planes, uh, many 90 and different aircraft, many uh, fighters. And then, as I was a test pilot, I was recruited to be uh, the pilot of Hermes. Not the bag Hermes, but the uh, Space Shuttle Hermes. It was a European launched by RM5, and I started in 1985, I was there in 1985, with Hermes, and Hermes uh, started to develop a little bit uh, in a difficult way, and, and the weight of Hermes went to 11 tons to 20 tons, but uh, the capacity of RM5 was 20 tons, so the Hermes program was, was finished in 1992. In the meantime, I was in training, and I was training in Russia, in the Soviet Union, then in Russia, and I flew with the Russian, and then I flew with the American, and I'm going to share all of that. So my first, my first mission was uh, this way, maybe. It was on the Soyuz aircraft. So we do the training in Russia, in, in uh, Star City, which is close to Moscow, maybe one hour of Moscow, in, in the east side of Moscow. At the time, it was a secret base, so I was not about to take any picture, and I have no picture to show you because it was a secret place, a military place. We do the training there in Russian, and I was uh, the only French with 5,000 Russians around me. I was not speaking French, I was not speaking Russian at all, so I had to learn Russian, uh, which was not the easiest past, easiest past of, the, of the story. And then, after four years of training, I went to Baikonur for the launch. So we launched on the Soyuz rocket that you see here, which is one of the oldest rockets in the world. This rocket flew almost 2,000 times. It's a, it's a record of rocket. And this rocket is made in Samara, which is the east-north part of Moscow. But we launched on Baikonur because we need to be very low, close to the equator, to get the front effect of the, of the rotation of the Earth to get the speed to go to, to space. And uh, for that, we need to be very low and we use Kazakhstan. Baikonur was uh, the best place to. So, Samara to, to Baikonur is about 3,000 kilometers with a Russian train. 
which is very, very uh, bumpy. And if the rocket arrives in a good condition in Baikonur, there is no test anymore. The test of the railway is enough and is more, uh, more than the test and the effort that we, that we will have during the launch. So this is to show you the kind of uh, way the Russians are testing their, their uh, rocket and their hardware. The rocket arrives horizontally. If you do that with Ariane 5 and you launch, you put the rocket vertically when you launch, the only rotation the rocket will break. So this is to show you that when it is Russian, it is very solid. So the rocket arrives to the launch pad. Yes, and you see the rocket on the launch pad vertically. And you see there is a launch, there is a launch frame uh, trench under the rocket in order to avoid to avoid to launch the, the, the waves coming into the horizontal plan, dumping on the rocket to destabilize the rocket. So the rocket is not a big, it's a 50 meter rocket, and uh, at the time of the day of the, of the launch, we launched the rocket, and you see my crew, so my crew is a two Russian, and I am in the middle. So this is the last picture, I would say human picture, you say goodbye to your family, to your parents, to your children, everybody is crying. So you are happy to go to space, but when you see people crying, you feel a bit, uh, a little bit worried about them, and you, you have a mixed feeling of uh, the worry of your family and the pleasure you have to go to space. So this is a difficult time, which is a bit of five, ten minutes, and this is the last comfortable picture. Then you climb on a small lift, which is pretty big, like a, a lift in a Osmanian apartment in Paris, or very small, and you get, you get to the rocket with one or two persons only, when you climb to the top of the rocket, then you crawl on a small tunnel and you sit on the Soyuz, on the spacecraft, on the top of the rocket. This totally is not very big. So if you want to sit on the rocket, if you have a person on the right side, you have to sit on the middle. When you are on the middle, you close the lid. When it is closed, you can sit on the right side. Then you open the lid for number two and then number three. So we sit, we start the sitting operation and to climb the lift about two hours and a half before launch. So obviously it's not the first day that we are in this situation because we are the simulator two years before with the same crew, so you know each other, you know very well, and all your operations have been repeated in the simulator many, many times, all the failures have been repeated. So when you go to space, you feel confident with any type of failure. When you go to the simulator, you have always a climb, Electrical failure, then radio failure, then engine failure, then you have uh, depressurization, and so the, the, the space suit gets inflated, so it's not very comfortable to work with, and then you have to operate and to land in the simulator with this situation, which is not easy. So you do that every week, like twice a week, so when you go to space, you feel very confident with any type of failure you can get. So it's not very big, I used to say it's like a small Fiat uh, Cinquecento, Fiat uh, <laughs> 500, that you are three in the front row with a space. So there is no way to move one millimeter left and right. It looks incomfortable, it, but it is enough as a comfortable. I have to confess, I did, uh, I did succeed to sleep in this situation in the oh. simulator, especially after lunch. <laughs> so this is the situation we are doing the launch. The seat is horizontal, so you are on your back, so you will launch with the pressure and the acceleration coming on your belly. And on this uh, picture, you can see the, the suit is inflated with 0.4 atmosphere of oxygen. Oxygen gives you the preservation of your body, the breathing of oxygen, and the cooling of your body. If you go to space and you have a leak on the cellulose, your body is going to boil in two minutes, so you die. So don't try to do it tonight, which is not good. So we had an accident with Russian and American in the beginning. So now we all go to space with a space suit in order to survive in case of the depolicization. And quite often it happens that we have depolicization during landing or during launch. So we, we do use this spacecraft, this space suit quite, quite uh, often. So um, on this situation, you can see uh, what you have uh, with your knees during, during launch, is, you, know, you don't have a lot of room, but it is enough and you feel good for launch. So the launch happened, you, as I told you, you sit uh, uh, two hours and a half before launch, 
and then you do all the checklists. All the checklists are made in about two hours, so you are you are finished for all your check. You are ready to launch, and then the announce lighting on the engine. Then uh, it's uh, a small power, middle power, full power. Full power. The rocket start to launch, but slowly. Why? Because the weight of the rocket is 500 tons. But the thrust is also 550 tons, so the ratio is a little bit more than one. But 90% of the weight of the rocket is kerosene and oxygen. So the weight is going to, to go down very quickly, and you get acceleration uh, fast enough. Like you, you get zero, you get four Gs on your belly after about 30 seconds. So when you are a fighter pilot, you take 10 Gs for 20 seconds, then you take four Gs for nine minutes. And after nine minutes, you get your space. So, the surprising effect of going to space is from ground to space, you move from zero to space to a speed of 28,000 km per hour, Mach 25, in less than 9 minutes. And once, once you are in space, the rocket is, is falling down behind you, the rocket is destroyed, you don't use the rocket anymore, it's not like a space X. And you just have a Soyuz spacecraft, so we sit on the capsule which is here, only this part will go back to Earth. This is the engine compartment. This is the vehicle, uh, which is the orbital module. So you have one radar, a second radar, one periscope, second periscope. So here you have six cubic meters. Here you have three cubic meters. So you have nine cubic meters to be. At the time of my launch, we used to stay two days in orbit in order to go to the space station on the Mir space station. Today we have new computers and we can launch and dock on the space station in three hours, which is a record made by the Russian from, from ground to space 10 minutes, from space to the station, three hours, and you are door open, walking on the space station. So once you are in space, you, you wait for the docking, and then you are docked on the space station, and for my, my first flight, I did medical experiment. So what happened when you're in space? All your blood is coming from your legs, going up to your, to your face, to cause that the moon face. The legs are going down slowly, so we cause that the chicken legs. And all your blood is going up to your head. But when you are on Earth, your heart has a real task to, to pump your blood to your, to your head. But in space, it's not necessary. So your, your heart is waiting about uh, one day, and after one day, it will slightly go down, it will slightly decrease in volume. Yeah. So we were, we were guessing your heart is modifying this volume, and this uh, condition, but we were not sure. So we took this uh, uh, ultrasound system that you can see here, and we take measurement of the four chamber of your heart uh, every day, and we, we see, we saw that uh, your heart is going down, and the left part of the, the heart and the right part of the heart is going down in a different way. And this all that is going stabilized in about seven or eight days until you stay in the same condition during the whole flight. So after you have to readapt yourself and you go back to Earth because you have a small heart and you risk you have the risk of a syncopa. So we need some training in space to avoid syncopa. So we, we learned that and we did the, we did this uh, study on the on myself and on a Russian. Just in case your heart are different between Russian and American and French, I can assure you. Same, uh, same story. And we do the Asbel curve, which is a small ultrasound system that we built at times, so we had to make it very small in order to go to space. So, this is my last uh, picture after a flight of two weeks, so two weeks in the space station. And I wanted to show you the, the side of the legs. After two weeks, there is nothing. You don't, you don't work every day, you don't exercise, you don't do exercise, you don't or running or walking, so your legs are very, very down. Your head is a bit bumpy because of the moon face. And uh, this is what you have to do. You wear this uh, suit because of the Kentia in order to, to get tight to your, to your legs. Because when you go down on, on Earth, your heart is very small and you risk a syncopa. So we avoid a syncopa with this kind of uh, anti G suit, which is tight. It's not this hair, it's made with laces. So we then we on the uh, on Soyuz spacecraft and then we wait to get to the orbit of landing. Usually, we, we, we fly over South America, Buenos Aires, and then we slow down the, sp the spacecraft about 100 meters per second, and the spacecraft 
will go down. When it goes down, we split it graphically, we separate the engine and the computer module when we go back horizontally and we wait Central Africa to slow down. When you slow down, you have to transfer your speed from Mach 25 to Mach 3, so your acceleration will go this way. You take 5 Gs, again on your belly, and you finish the deceleration with your vertical Kazakhstan, and then you open the parachute, small, very small one, then the medium one, then the big one to land on the Kazakhstan. So when, when you land, you see the splash part landing on the right side, and then when you are one meter from the ground, we open automatically uh, what we call DMP, which is an engine of soft landing. What does that mean, soft landing in Russia? <laughs> <laughs> if you land and you are alive, it is soft landing. If not, <laughs> we don't talk about that. Soft landing will take 15 Gs during landing. So if you are lucky, the parachute and the spacecraft stays vertical, which is a good landing. If you are not lucky with a bit of wind, there is no engine to slow down your balancing left and right. You, you hit on the side and your spacecraft is going to, to roll down on the side. Which is my spacecraft here, so it was burning. But the temperature when you re-enter is about 2,000 degrees. So, and we, we bump on the left, so we bounce two or three times. So inside the spacecraft, obviously we are very tight, as I showed in the first picture. But all the stuff we brought with us was starting to fall down on us, left and right. It was a kind of... A, not a very comfortable situation. And we still, uh, today, go to space and land with the Soyuz. I mean, we have the Soyuz and also we have the, the SpaceX uh, from the from Columbus. So, and I like this picture because this picture shows you about 50,000 of transportation, 50,000 years of transportation. And every time we have invented a way of transport, a new way of transport, there was never a drawback, never went back and never quit it a way of transportation. So that was my first mission, and this is the picture after landing. We are still inside the capsule. It looks like a movie, it's not a movie. The helicopter are landing just at the same time as you are. The doctors are inside the helicopter and they, they join you in order to help you if you have any kind of problem or single power or if just if you are hurt during landing. And then we go back to we fly with a plane to rush to, to Almaty with a helicopter and then from Almaty to Moscow or to Houston, depending on if you are Russian or American. So, second mission, so I went uh, in space in 92 with a Soyuz on the space station here. Then in 92, the space, pro the space program Hermes was finished, so I was uh, without any program. But in 93, the Russians signed the agreement of cooperation with NASA to do an international space station. But Americans did not want too much the space station with Russia. Russia neither wanted the space station venture, so it was a political way to convince people to work together and to have a line of communication between uh, West and East. This line still exists today, even during the war. So this station, this station helps us to have a communication between astronauts and cosmonauts, even when it is very tight on the ground. So I flew on the space to Columbia, I went to NASA to help Americans to work with the Russian, and finally I flew in 99 uh, on the space to Columbia. And you will see the... It's the last minute before launch.
small video of the launch where you see the last bit before launch we have to check that all the systems are go, all the go that you listen is a control center of uh, Kennedy Space Center. All of the lights have to be green before launch. And the, the final um, count is about 15 seconds before launch. Six seconds before launch we light the primary engine. On the Soyuz rocket it is kerosene and oxygen. On this one it is hydrogen and oxygen. So the thrust is, is higher. And then the, during the launch at T0 we just light also the booster. So we light with a two booster with a three cryo engine. So the, the power of the, the thrust is about 2,500 tons for a weight of 2,000 tons. So when, when I said on the Russian side you, you start slowly, when they say, when they say this, time zero, you sit on your back again, but you sit, you feel the pressure of about 2.5 3 g right away. The, the rocket is so powerful that after 30 seconds, in order to avoid the Qmax, Qmax is what we call the speed maximum with the density of the air, which is maximum, we have to raise the risk of um, bending the, the space craft, the space shuttle. So in order to avoid the bending of the, the twisting of the space craft, we just reduce uh, the power of the main engine, the cryo engine, are going to idle, which idle for us is 70%. So you launch, so you don't have to launch, you are still vibrating all the way, and the power going to 70%. And then when the Qmax is finished, you are, you are high enough, the air is less than before, so then you go back to thrust power. This is what we, we heard during the radio, you guys said, go to the power max at this time. And once a day to two minutes, it's full power with the cryo engine and the booster. After two minutes, the booster are empty. They are ejected, jettisoned on the side. They fall on the water with a small parachute. And then we recover them to bring them back to Kennedy Space Center. We just uh, uh, clean them again and we use them for the next flight. So we use, we reuse the booster, we reuse the spacecraft, the engines, the astronaut, obviously. We just lose. The main, the main tank, which is the yellow tank that you see here, which is full of hydrogen and oxygen, and the launch time during, uh, for space shuttle back to Soyuz is also in minutes. You go to space in minutes. And then you turn around the Earth at the speed of Mach 25, which is 16 times a day during, during the flight. You turn around the Earth. The equilibrium speed, when you're at low altitude, we are about 400 kilometers of altitude. So then, on this mission, we deployed, this is my mission and my crew, and that was the first mission commanded by a woman, by a, woman, by a female, Aline Collins, if you see here, she was the first fighter pilot, test pilot of the US. She flew the F-15, so if, I don't know if you know the it's a very big airplane. She was very small, and she was a, one of the best pilots of F-15. Uh, he was a pilot of F-18, he was a sport engineer, so he sits during launch, between the pilot and the captain in order to, to help them during a, if there is a failure. And the two of us were uh, responsible to deploy this uh, telescope called Chandra, which is aiming to look at all the X-ray coming from the black holes, neutron star, and all the phenomena coming from space. So we were in space, and then we deployed the telescope to see Chandra. So it was a big telescope, it, it took the old payload bay of the space shuttle, so we took a flight of five days of me and five people. Usually all the flights are 15 days with seven person on board, but we were too heavy because of the telescope, so the flight was short. Then uh, the short flight, we go back to Earth. You see, and the difference of the Russian, we have a spacesuit for the polarization in case of leak, but the cooling is made by a space uh, blue suit, which has kind of a water inside in order to cool your body uh, during the launch. So we are there, it is a rocket during launch, special is a rocket during launch, it's a small space station when you are in orbit, when you don't as you like it. So we have to re-enter, uh, uh, reducing the speed to go down, and you attack the, the 100 kilometers of atmosphere with an angle of attack of 40 degrees. And then you have to calculate your trajectory with, with uh, S turns during the round three in order to land in the uh, Kennedy Space Center as a driver. So there is no engine to pull up in case you made a mistake. It's like an Airbus, it's not like an Airbus, you just have to land as a driver. So, short story of space is not my two missions, and 
show you space is here. We look at the, what, uh, what happened in space, but you see on the, on the right corner is the first company launched in 57. So it launched in 57 from Baikonur with a rocket so used like the one I use, and the engine we are made by Von Braun, the German Von Braun. And the same Von Braun was prisoner in Texas at the time of the launch, it was in 57. So it was a big problem for America because they said, well, if it is not a, a small radio, but it is a nuclear bomb, we are still, we are all dead. And we don't know what was inside. Inside there was a beep to make, uh, to make some sound for people having a receiver, and it was uh, metallic in order to be seen very well. So it was a propaganda Sputnik to show to the rest of the world we are the first, we are in space and we are the first. So that was 1957. And then Gagarin went to space in 61. So Gagarin, again, he was the first person to go to space. And we wanted to see, we are not sure, even if we launched Laika before, we were not sure that a human could be alive in space. So uh, we, did, we did one turn of the Earth. So we launched from Bengalo, did one turn, and he landed in Kazakhstan. We wanted to see if he can stay alive in space. Because Laika didn't say if she had a problem or not. We just saw her with a, with a big video. And he said, I can breathe, I can look at the earth, I can, or I can move my hands, so if everything is fine. So he landed in Kazakhstan, it was the first mission, and he never forget. And then we have been increasing uh, the, the time of the, of the flight from one hour to one day to, to two weeks, to uh, then we went to six months, one year, 14 months, went to the moon, and we are uh, today on the space station. So all other historic dates is the first American in space was John Glenn in 1962. So because Gagarin did one turn of the Earth, Glenn did three turns of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So the time, the time of 1961-62 is like a competition between Russia and America. Every flight has to be the other. So John Glenn was the first American that he flew more than Gagarin because he did three turns of the Earth. So the, Russian look at that and say, well, not difficult, we're going to fight and we're going to win another, another race. Because they knew that they had the right stuff, seven men selected as astronauts in America. So the Russians said, we're going to fly a woman in space, to be the first woman in space. But there was no woman fighter pilot at the time, there was no woman test pilot at the time. So we took the two pilots to she is not a pilot. She is an engineer in a tires factory, so it's like a Michelin company. Uh, but she is a parachutist during the weekend, and she's a, at a very high level. She's an instructor parachutist. She has like 2,000 free fall jumps, so they took her. And at the time, you cannot learn with your Soyuz. You just have to go back to the atmosphere. At 5,000 meters, you have to eject with the ejector of the seat. So a parachutist would be fine to this kind of flight, but they wanted the first woman in space. She flew, and she did, she was the first woman in space. Then, Leonov did the first EA. So what happened? They flew the Soyuz, not the Soyuz, but the spacecraft, like my spacecraft, in 1965. There was a room for three persons, but there were only two on board. They have a spacecraft, a little bit bigger than the one I had on the, on the Russian side. And once they were in space, they just opened a small tunnel on the top of the spacecraft, and Leonov went to the tunnel with his spacecraft. He just pressurized his spacecraft, and then when the pressurized, it was closed on the, at the feet, closed on the top. He depressurized the small tunnel, opened the door, and went outside. First extravehicular activity. First time a human could go outside of a spacecraft with a spacesuit. He went outside. The duration was supposed to be about 15 minutes, and after six minutes, we heard a boom, a puff, like a big, big noise. So the guy inside called Alexei, you have a problem? No answer. So the guy turned himself, looked at the window, and he saw the other with the arms and the, and the legs open like this. He didn't move at all. So we, we believe he was dead or something like this, so we did not understand. Uh, so the guy inside was ready to go outside to take him again and to recover him, you know, to go back to Earth with him. And after a few minutes, we saw the other moving a little bit and he tried to re-enter the tunnel. He tried with the legs first, but he didn't re-enter. He tried with the head first, he didn't re-enter. The suit was too big compared to the tunnel. Why? 
Because when you do a, a, a simulator chamber on the ground, the depressurization is made by uh, taking the air back, but it's not the full zero, it's zero, degree zero one. And because the side of the tunnel was too small compared to the spacecraft, it couldn't re-enter. So he had to do something forbidden for an astronaut. He had, he had to depressurize a little bit his spacesuit. Remember, if you depressurize your spacesuit, you die in two minutes. So he didn't pressurize fully, but a little bit, and it took his time, he re-entered, and then he was inside the spacecraft. So he was almost dead, but he recovered. So it was, it was not finished, the mission was not finished, because then they had to re-enter to Kazakhstan, and the navigation system was not good. So instead of landing in Kazakhstan, they landed behind in Saturday in February. So 50 meters of snow. So it was a real soft landing in this case. <laughs> and they landed. It was, it was a very complicated mission. So they waited five minutes, ten minutes before opening the lid on the top. And after five minutes, Leonov opened the lid slowly. And when you open it, you saw white bear and, and wolf outside. So close, call Moscow, saying Moscow, we have a problem. And uh, the, the, the bear was recovered, taken to a, a circus, it was taken to a circus. And after this time, we got a gun against the bear inside the zoo. The only weapon we have is a gun against the bear. So that was the first day of Leonov. Then the moon landing in uh, 69, the first moon landing with Aldrin and Armstrong. And then the, the shuttle flew from 81 to 2001. Then the first tourist in space, the Institute. The Institute is a, is a guy extremely motivated to be an astronaut. So when he is 10 years old, he says, what can I do to be an astronaut? Well, you have to study very well, the best you can do, and you have to do a lot of exercise at the maximum. So he did the MIT, which is like a polytechnic, very high school, he did a lot of exercise. He tried to get to, to NASA, but he was refused one time. He tried again, he refused again, and he tried three times. And you have three, you, have, you cannot do more than three times when you get to NASA. So he was refused forever, and he was, he was uh, very disappointed, but because of his background, he opened a, a business of electronics, and he, become, he became a billionaire very easily and very quickly. And, but he was always looking at, uh, at space programs, he said, well, I have, I have a lot of content, but I don't want to have money, I, work, I just want to fly in space. So every, every year we have a congress of uh, astronautics everywhere in the world, that's once, once a year, and every time there was a congress he was there, talking to the Russians, he said, well, I would like to fly, I can pay money to fly with, with my payment, I can buy three rockets, you can, you can use three rockets on your side with my payment. And the Russians said no. So he tried again, he tried in 20, 20 years. And then at the end, the Russians said, okay, yes. So he was the first one, determined, determined, he had determination to fly in space, and he, he did the flight. After having six hours of tourists, flew to space, paying a kind of a very, very important so because the flight is about 20 million dollars. Uh. <laughs> then the first Chinese in space, we call him a Taikonaut, Chinese Taikonaut, right. uh, a Russian cosmonaut, American astronaut. And uh, the last one is Indian, they are violent. So the first uh, Taikonaut in 2003 flew in space. So Chinese program is very, very straightforward. They copied the Russian system and they told the Russian what we to copy and to make it like you. The spacecraft is the space suit, the same. Um, the spacecraft is not a Soyuz, it's a Shenzhou. So the small difference, the rocket is made also in China, but it's very similar to what they do in Russia. So he flew successfully, and um, even if we criticize sometimes the Chinese, it is the only space agency that flew human during, uh, from 2003 to today without any accident. All the other had accidents, but they learn stories and they learn lessons from the world. Then, then 2012 is the first mission of SpaceX. Elon Musk, I met Elon Musk in 95 at NASA. He was, uh, with jeans and t-shirts and said, well, what are you doing here? Why well, I'm going to build more and to fly to space. So we were a bit, uh, not teasing him, but we were laughing at him. He was not serious, he was very young, he was like a, like a baby, and he said, I want to make more bed. We knew he made PayPal, and we knew he was rich, but to make a rocket is very serious. Nobody, nobody believed he could do it, but he did it. He 
made this rocket with his own money. He failed at the beginning, and the rocket was destroyed because of a technical problem. But at the end, the rocket was successful. And then, in 2012, he sent the first automatic mission to the space station. And then recently, like uh, two years ago, he started to launch a human space. So this guy has started the whole thing from zero to space mission, human space mission, with a lot of problems with his own money, own money, and so today he has a very successful company. And then 2017, China is declining to go to the moon, not to put a Chinese restaurant on the moon, but to explore, to explore the ground of the moon, and the moon has 500,000 tons of helium-3. Helium-3 is the carburant of the nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the new nuclear power that we have we will have in the future. On, on Earth, we have 200 kilograms. On the Moon, we have 500,000 tons. So we have like 10,000 years of energy sitting on the Moon. And the Chinese say, we go to the Moon to take the energy because we need more energy for people on Earth. So it was, there was a different path between Russian and American. You see Russian, we have a classical rocket, a classical spacecraft. Uh, they had the seven seven space station. One of them was the military one. They had a Mir space station for them. It was a Soviet space station, then a Russian space station. But these stations helped also to make the joint between the space shuttle and the spacecraft. And they tried to have on the moon, but they never succeeded because the Karayov, who was the main constructor, uh, died in 1965. But at the end, it was very complicated to, to, to take his, his position. On the other side, Americans had Mercury for one person, Gemini for two people, Apollo for three persons going to the moon or to Skylab. That was a unique space station to NASA, of NASA. Then they went to the moon six times. They had a space shuttle during 30 years. So you see a different path, a very recruiting path for the Russian, a kind of a zigzag path for American, and a kind of a competition always between the Russian and American. But there was a joint mission called Apollo Soyuz in 1965, where you see the, the Apollo spacecraft is on the left here, the Soyuz is on the right, and the joint in space, after training, after many years of training, the joint in space with this kind of a docking system here in 1965, in 1975, to, to, to show the friendship between, in space between Russian and Americans. That was in 1975. And the flight in 1975 was, was done after the meeting of the crew in 1972. So the crew is on the picture here. You see the Russian are in green on the right, the American are here on the left. And on these five people, two persons two person became friends. They were astronauts and cosmonauts. Two of them became friends from 72 up to the death which is up to them. And because of this friendship, and because they were a member of their own government, they started to initiate the International Space Station, and they always tried to, to, to decrease the tension between America and Russia at all times. So the two persons are Tom Stafford, that you can see here, and Alexei Olof, the one that did it, first did it. So he was a fighter pilot, he was a prisoner in Vietnam, he uh, escaped from Vietnam, so he was a very strong man. Sent for a lot, very strong man, first TVA, and they became friends. And you can see on this picture here, the picture of uh, not today, but 2019, because uh, uh, Leonov passed away in 2019. But you see uh, um, Stafford on the left and, and Leonov on the right. I have always seen them in, the, in my 40 years of uh, career as an astronaut, always together. They were always taking vacation together, either in the USA or in Russia, and they have always given the, the, the best of their will to save the political situation between Russia and the and, uh, and, and, uh, USA. And you can see uh, Leonov passed away three years ago, and you can see always the situation now is going down. So either a link, I am not sure, but there was something because during that time there was no problem at all. So we went from confrontation to cooperation, or competition to cooperation. Uh, the confrontation gave speed to the program, but there was no motivation of science. I have a friend who went two times to the moon. On the second landing, we gave him a, a car, an electrical car, 
and uh, he had to go from the LEN, which is a module where they landed to a point, which is 10 kilometers, and go back. So he, he took his car, uh, the electrical car, and he went to a point, he came back, and then after the mission, he, he called uh, Houston, he said, Houston, the car is working very well. You know, the ground is very bumpy, but the, the amortization is good, the turn is very good, the acceleration is, is very good. Uh, uh, Thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much. What can I do? Do you want uh, to say anything else? Yes, I have one hour of autonomy remaining. What can I do? Well, John, uh, we have nothing specific for you. Uh, do whatever you want. And he did, he did uh, one hour of derapage um, controlé, I forgot the name. Uh, he, tried, he did turn you know, like a rapping turn. He tried to put the, the car on two wheels on the side. He never succeeded because the car is very wide. So it was not very good science. And when you see that on YouTube, you say, well, the motivation to pay a billion of dollars to this mission was not good. And this is why we went to the moon for political reasons, but there was no science behind. This is why we never went to the moon again. But today we go back to the moon for scientific reasons. So today we have cooperation, so it's slower, it's more efficient. And also we have cooperation with five partners. So American, which is NASA, Russian, Canada, European, and Japan. So all together, 15 space agencies are working together and we try to cooperate with also China. So today it's not easy between China and the uh, USA, but at one point we will get there. And also India, because India has started two years ago the human space program for, for their own uh, country. And this is a picture I took, took a, taken on the, on the website, on the Twitter, and you can see a picture inside the space station, they cut the hair, which is what we do on Saturday afternoon because we work during the, the week. And you see on the, on the right side is an American astronaut, on the left side is a Russian astronaut. So you, we share tasks like cutting hair between American and Russian. So the friendship is working very well. Even today, well, today is very difficult on the ground, the people work the same way on space. So this is when, from Apollo Soyuz, we did this space station. The first mission was here, so it is uh, Apollo Soyuz from New Newton, a Russian module launched from Baikonur, no number one launched from Cap Canaveral, Kennedy Space Center, that was in 98. So, this was the first mission, and then we started to build the station slowly to get to the whole space station. And you can see here the Russian side, this is American module, this is a Japanese module, this is a European module, Columbus, this is a space shuttle. The robotic, uh, the Canadian robotic arm, second arm, this is a thrust with power belonging to NASA, and this is ATV launched from Iron 5 to give supply to the space station. We launched five times ATV to pay the launch of Columbus, which was on the back of the space station. So, this is an old space station. It took us like 10 years to build it, and it will fly up to 2031. So, on this space session, we have uh, what we call incremental confidence, we have slowing confidence. You can imagine between Russian and American, the confidence went from below zero to a, to a good level. So, today, I guess it's going down, but in space, there was never a failure of trust between Russian and American. And the, the, the trust, the confidence, was also the common vision. The common vision was to build the flag Earth on the moon, and the flag Earth flew once in space with me, with me, the Atlantic moon, you see the flag is here. So the flag Earth was good, but it was made only by French people. So this is when the flag is of Earth is made by one country, he has no success for the other partner. So I took him in space only once. So now we, I will show you how do we do with a team, with a crew of astronauts, what we call the astronaut 2.0. Uh, all the flag of the space station are here. So, we fly at 51.6 degrees. This is the inclination of the orbit. If you take the equator, this is zero. If you take the pole, this is 90 degrees. So we are 51.6. Why 51.6? If you draw a line between Baikonur and the border of China, it is 51.5. At the time where Russia and China were enemy, it was forbidden that the rocket could Four on the Chinese part. So we took 51.6, and the whole Earth, the whole people on Earth are flying at 51.6 only for this border limitation between China and Russia. 
Altitude is about uh, 400 kilometers, uh, 100 meters by 100 meters, 1 million pounds of weight. It took us 28 shuttle flights and 41 Russian flights, two Venus space stations. So regularly seven flights a year, alternatively between Russian and American, to build this huge space station and 800 hours of EV. Every time you put two modules together, we have to go outside to do an EVA, to go outside and to put the electrical and hydraulic links together. So this is the, the crew responsibility is made between five space agencies. So the share is a kind of a, a strength. If you are Russian, you are only Russian and you share with the tourists. If you are US, the US side is shared between NASA, Canada, European and Japan. For all the parts, like being an astronaut, doing extra nuclear activities, doing robotic activity, or doing the commandership of the space station. So it's a shape which is different between Russian and American. So to fly in space, the, the Noria is very simple. At the beginning, the station is empty. You launch a Soyuz with three persons. The three astronauts will take in space during three months. After three months, we launch a new Soyuz with three new cosmonaut or astronaut, and they will make a, what we call a direct handover. They will talk together during three months. They will explain what are the differences between the station as it is and the simulator on the ground. It is impossible to make a simulator like the space station to explain the whole system, what is breaking in, uh, quickly, what, 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 uh, what is needed to, to take care of. So it takes three months. After three months, to be able to stay three or three, six months on Earth, the three new guys became the old one, and I launched a new Soyuz after 10 or 15 days in order to have again a direct on So it's very difficult because with four Soyuz here, I have always six persons on board with a handover of three months of three persons to the new and to the old guys. So for that, we apply a, a matrix qualification for all of them because. You cannot learn all the space station. And I put an example on the slide here. So you see the tasks are on the left in English, in Russian here. The names are here. And you have one or two or, or five crosses in front of your name. And you train only for that because it is impossible to be trained for all the tasks of the space station. For example, he is Russian, so it is his turn to be the commander. Or the turn of uh, sitting as a commander of the space station has to be shared equally between Russian and American. If we fly 30 years with the space station, we have to be exactly the same number of commandership, American and Russian. Then, because the Russian is a commander of the Soyuz, only the Russian can be the captain of the spacecraft going to, to space. So if it is American, uh, SpaceX or Space Shuttle, it is an American, not uh, another country. And if it is Russian, only the Russian. So then, this is the, the space time, or the, we call that online short term planning review. This is the time you have every day, the, the planning of your day. So you have the three astronauts here, the first Soyuz, three of the second Soyuz here. We have the time in red, the time is in GMT. You have to take the Greenwich time because we have the time which is equally shared between Russian and American. So it's more. I don't take just for Russian, but we take GMT. <coughs> Six o'clock GMT, you have to wake up. Every day is need to wake up. If you are tired, it be 6 15, 6 30, but you have to be ready at 7 30. 7 30 is the daily planning conference. It is a small speech that you do. You are all together and you talk to the space control of Houston to say that you receive the program of the day. Is there any differences during the night or not? What are the things modified during the last day? And you go to the Russian space control, Canadian space control, Munich for European and Japan in, uh, in Jackson. And then you start to work and you have the colors, the color code from some of the two of them. They know easily they work together or the two of them will work together. And you have them up to the mid, uh, the lunch at the midday and then up to the end of the day. So you have the same planning every day up to uh, end of the day, which is 8 o'clock, and you work from Monday to Friday. On uh, Saturday morning, you have a different task. It could be uh, different points of measurement for 
a scientist, it could be teaching for the school, or it could be also cleaning of the space station. So you have to do all these three tasks and you have to share all of them. And you are free between Saturday morning up to Sunday evening, which is free time to do Skype with your family, to do uh, some uh, picture of outside, a picture of Earth, to read books, to watch movies, whatever you want. But you have to rest a lot because the, the, from Monday to Friday is kind of a difficult uh, and complicated uh, time life. So, to be honest, you have to do a selection. It takes one year. Actually, we do one today. I mean, this year, one is in process. One year of association. Then, when you are selected, you do the basic training, which is 18 months, where you get a diploma of astronaut. Then, when you are finished, you have to do uh, advanced training, which is one month in each order center. So, if you are European, you have to stay, you have to go to Houston one month, and to Moscow one month, and to Tsukuba, then to Montreal. So, it takes about six months or seven months. And then you wait for the blue dot here, which is a sign on who, which is the two percent of the spacecraft suit. And then you do 13 months of training in all the cycle part, which is difficult. One month in Houston, one thematic, one exam, then you fly to Moscow, one month of learning, one thematic, one exam, when you do the same one month every year, and you start again with planes that are not uh, flying at the right time, with bad weather, with luggage lost sometimes. So the, the training is kind of difficult compared to the flight. The flight then is six months, as you can see here, and after the flight you go back to, to the blue line. And all the space agents have the same problem. Either you are European, American, Russian, Japanese, or Italian, it's the same schedule for all of them, and these are the space centers. So, we, we have a difficult life, the flight is difficult, and to do the space station, we prepare the space station and we did some training. The training was to use the, the Mir space station and we docked the space shuttle to the, to the Mir space station. We did seven or eight times docking and each of the station we transfer uh, is a, a NASA astronaut from the space station to uh, the space station, to the space shuttle to the space station. So you can imagine yourself, you are American, you get engaged to go to NASA to, to speak English only, to fly a short flight with American on the space shuttle, and instead they ask you to fly a long duration mission in Russia on the near space station. So there was not too many volunteers. And during the, the mission of docking, during the seven mission, where the two main figures were the fire in space and where the collision with the depressurization. So it was the two main figures in space were at the time the docking of the space shuttle to the space station near. And because of that, and because the directions were not always the best, there was a journalist, Brian Borough, who wrote his book, I Don't Fly. He explained that the astronauts don't have the best psychological behavior, they don't react very well, there is no cohesion between the crew. I mean, the thing was so bad that we had to react. We had the space agency, government, we had to modify the selection process, we had to modify the training of the astronaut. And the book is also in French, Chris and Mother Stasuzi. So we, we did a selection with new characteristics that we call the sham, the C for congruence. Congruence means alignment, which is I think, I say, I do are the same. If you are in space during six months with someone who thinks something, he says differently and he does a third action, it's really difficult at the end. And the congruence is the main, the main characteristic and the main quality we are requesting for us. Then humility, because for instance, I am an for already uh, 35 years. Tomorrow I go to the sea level, I do my switching a little bit fast, I don't follow the checklist very well. And the young instructor said, well, Michel, you did a mistake, you went too fast. If I don't have a humility, I don't recognize my mistake. Humility is just to recognize your mistake to make the next past better in order to be safe in space. So humility is really one of the best uh, qualities for us at home. Assertiveness is the double respect. So you can imagine also that when you fly six points in space, assertiveness is one of the most important requirements. And motivation, because training is difficult, selection is difficult, only motivation will take you to the launch and to the to the whole process of training. You, you can have a feeling that sometimes it's 
really difficult, you want to quit. Motivation will help you. And motivation is not motivation, motivation of money. We don't have a lot of money. It's not motivation of, uh, of uh, having a nice car or a nice apartment. It's motivation, we call that noble, motivation linked to the emotion, uh, emovere in Latin. And this emotion is the only one taking you to the emotion. To the and once you have the selection with uh, the four characteristics that I call sham, we have to do uh, the making of the crew going to the cohesion and to the signage. And to get there, we have made a new process called training where we put friction in the crew. Inside the crew, we put conflicts between them. We put stress individually and collectively. This is what we call the HPP for human behavioral performance. Increasing the performance of the crew in terms of human behavior. And this works well. We started all of that in 2003 after the book Dragonfly. So all that Shan plus LDP is coming from the consequences of this book Dragonfly. So this is a pool I selected in, 19, uh, in 2008, which uh, one person from UK, Denmark, Germany, Italy, French, Italy. So Italian, two Italian because we have double cooperation between. Uh, Italy and ISA, Italy and NASA. Uh, Matthias Moore is German, he is actually friend in space today. He was not selected as an astronaut, he was selected as an engineer because we have one more flight on the German side and because he was very he was very helpful for the astronaut, he did get this mission and it was good. And these are the crew selected with me in 92 with Italy, Germany, uh, Sweden. Belgium, myself, Germany, French, Netherlands, Switzerland, Claudie Collier, Italy, Germany, French, Italy, French, uh, Germany, Spain. So you need the, the, the crew of the astronaut is a representation of all Europeans going to space and all of them have flown two or three times. So the, the training for HPP is not made in a simulator. We do this training on analogous uh, field like those, the mountain, is national outdoor leadership training or school. It is a civilian training that we, that exists on the paper, and NASA get involved, got involved with them in order to do training for the astronauts. So we have one astronaut, one psychologist, one doctor uh, in the crew, and every day we do a path from A to B and B to C and so on. The change of leader evidence, so you have to learn to be a leader, which we don't want to, so people don't accept, but you have to be really capable of being leader and being number two. And we make publication on the crew every time. Then Nemo is the same, but underwater, so we stay underwater during uh, about uh, two weeks, and we have tasks to perform regularly. And every two or three days, you do an EVA, you go outside of the, of the spacecraft in the water, like an EVA, extra then Cold Lake, this is a training in the north of Canada. Um, it's very cold, uh, like we do it in February, and during all night we ask us not to measure on scientific measurement outside, so they don't sleep. If you reduce the sleeping time of a person, you increase his, his aggressiveness, and we test assertiveness that we need for this training. Then the case, so we, we used to, uh, to have the same training as American, we do caves, which is underground, so like a spiral uh, training, and during two weeks. And uh, the good point of this training is that you are sure to have no link with your phone or with your computer, and you have no link with the daylight or, or, or nightlight, so you don't know where you are at the time. So at the end, they say, well, we finish tomorrow, and tomorrow is an eight day, but uh, the, the finish is in two weeks, so you never know when you finish the training, and this is really stressing for the people, and it's one of the best training. We're going to like 500 meters underground, and then the Russians are doing sea training and winter training survival on the Soyuz, and this is, we count that as a training and like a HDP training for the Russians. And we reinforce HDP of all the men, so if someone is weak, we will increase slowly his capability in terms of HDP. If he's very strong, you can get more stress. And if we take Shad plus LDP, there is no choice of the crew. Before that, we used to use a process code to choose the color of each crew member. 
process controls very well for short flight when all is okay, but when you have a fire, when you have uh, like something very stressful, the process com is not so efficient. What we do with Shannon plus LP is much more efficient. So these are uh, the, the letter of the sham. The congruence, I think I say I do. With the, this this uh, congruence is excellent to give confidence when you are in a crew, when you do a, a very complicated task, it's very important to have confidence, and this is met with uh, the congruences, and this is also innovation. Humility is not shyness, we are not to be afraid of confrontation, and assertiveness is a double respect to have a better communication. There is no concept. The, the worst thing is if you are on the ground during three years of training, there is something you want to say to your crewmate, but you don't dare to tell him. And at the end, you are in space with the stress, with the fire and everything. You are going to explode, and these are the bad words you are going to say. This is why you use the chaos. The chaos is when you have to say the, the right thing to the, to the person at the right time. The motivation to hold through the training, and Sham is also an example of value. When I became an astronaut, I saw people like uh, Tom Stafford or Leonov, they had a sham, so I want, I want to look like them, if, even if I will not do the same as they do. So it's an example value which we, we recommend and we, we see from uh, you to all or to, from all to leaders. So these are pictures in uh, calf training in Europe, in Sardinia. So you see we're going down under the ground. The last day of the training, we put them uh, with a helicopter by night on a small boat, and let's say if there are five uh, people on the boat, we give them four rows in order to go back to the, to the, <coughs> the system. So you see, they have to share again, and they have to be stressed to make a complication every time on the train. Then this are again the uh, Cain Sardinia, and this is the uh, Nemo underwater. These are the pictures that are simulating the training for the space station, but we also today prepare the operation we were doing on the moon. These are operations that are made on the moon. And these are the Russian training. If the Soyuz land on the water, so we have to survive on the water, and this is a winter survival. And this is my, uh, this is my last slide. And uh, the last slide is made on the sect, a philosophical uh, idea of uh, the Earth as a cradle of unity, we don't have to spend the whole life on the cradle. And this is made by Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. He was a philosopher, engineer, and he was the first engineer that invented the rocket with a three-state rocket, which are using even today. Thank you very much. So you say that you, you think of uh, the accident, you think it's possible to an accident. But you have been, I have been waiting uh, seven years. I was sitting in 85 and I went on top of the rocket in uh, 92. So at the time you are so motivated, you want to fly. Even if you have a risk, you want, you want to dedicate your, your time spent in training for the mission. And you trust the people because on the Soyuz, as I showed before, there is a kind of... Uh, uh, ejection tower. So if something goes wrong during launch, this tower will eject the spacecraft at 10 kilometers and save the astronaut landing on the on the parachute in Kazakhstan. So you, you you think of a lot of things, and when you worry, you, you just talk to your friend on the side. You say, well, but it is noise. I have heard, and they, so we talk together. We talk to the ground, and this communication helps you in terms of stress as well. Is there any specific memory, you know, something that will, will, you will remember for, forever, something very special that happened to you in the year? Well, not in the year. Well, <laughs> I, 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 I,
good six and bad things. So you want the good or the bad? Both. Both. <laughs> well, the, the bad, um, the bad uh, when I came to Russia in uh, 86, um, I was military, I was a colonel, lieutenant colonel of the Air Force, I was working on a nuclear aircraft and everything, so I was kind of an enemy of Russia. So some Russians did not like me, even hated me. And my boss on the Russian side did not like me at all. And one day, I remember it was, uh, I came in November, it was in February, I came in a Monday morning and the guy said, Michel, I want to talk to you. And he said, I saw on the road, we had the one classroom for all the, the French people, so every, every country had this classroom. And there was some writing on the, on the board saying, uh, the communist is the worst system in the world, it's something very bad for, for Russia. But it was writing with a good letters, and I, my, my Russian at the time was not good enough to write so well, so I explained. I, I can write a sentence, uh, I can, I'm capable of writing things. So obviously, it's a Russian who did it. But there was doubt, and at the time, I felt very down, and I said, well, they hate me so much, I want to quit. And my boss at the time was Jean Cretin, he was also a French and he said, well, I understand you, so just uh, stay up to June, go on vacation in summertime in France, and when you come back in September, if you still want to quit, it's fine. So it was a, a good approach, and uh, I stopped, I, I continued my job, and I became a two times. So the good memory now is, uh, when we launched in space, so all the vibrations are very strong, all things, all things are very heavy, and after two days of navigation behind the space station, we arrive at a distance of uh, 20 kilometers of the space station. At the time, we are slightly down on the left, and we are at the level of the terminator. The terminator is uh, the boundary between day and night. At, at the position of the terminator, everything is cold in space. So I arrived, and I was tired, it was two days without sleeping. Imagine you spent two days uh, in the nightclub, so we start today with my boss. So I, I was a little bit uh, clinky, and on the window of the right, I was on the, on the right side, and by my window, I saw this gold, gold thing. It is a space station that I see on the gold thing, and it was like incredible because it is golden, and because we are below, you don't see the reference of Earth, so this is like it was if it was hauled by, by a, a string, like this. I said, wow, this is really amazing. So I, Talk to my commander on the side, look at the space station, say, well, fine, I will put the spacecraft on the right side and we do the docking. But this image is still uh, very strong on me. And after the whole flight, is really so different from what you expect and what you see on the ground. You, you feel yourself, you feel the diseasedness of the uh, vestibular motion sickness, all, all that is not comfortable. All the liquid is going to your head, so I had, I had a very high pressure on my head, which is not comfortable, so the first day are not very good, but you get used to it. And the, the good thing is, after a few days, everybody gets used to it and you get uh, really good. You put something in front of you, it will hold because it's your gene and it is natural. So we get an adaptation which is uh, going from zero to one or one to zero, and you get used very, very easily. So adaptation of the human is really excellent. I'm sure I have the answer. Uh, tomorrow, uh, if you have a launch pad here, I go back. Yes, but we will go back. Uh, uh, by, by the way, one of my friends, uh, uh, Michael Lopez Lecaya, we, we did all the training at NASA together, is going to fly in space uh, on the 3rd of April. He's a little younger than me, but no, there is. Uh, 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 all, all the 500 astronauts that we are, all the, of them said if they can fly to space, they will fly again. It's an addiction. Like, real addiction to space, to, to experiment your body in space, to see the Earth from space, to build the OG, and to be part of the crew which is doing a, a very big part of science for humankind. Huh? And family. Yes. Yes. I, I know you in the presentation of our French team, Pesquet? Well, uh, I showed you a picture of uh, all the astronauts. Pesquet was one of them, but we selected all of them with the same process. So he was, he was uh, going from uh, 8,400 candidates to 1,000 to 200, 
15 for the medical test and 20 for the final ball. And he was uh, excellent. But on the final ball, there was only three French. And he was, he was the best one, so there was no, no problem at all for him. And uh, all of them have been selected with, uh, with a sham and HPP after, and they all behave very well. I mean, Pesquet is very well known in France, but if you go to Germany, nobody knows Pesquet. And instead, uh, uh, Matthias Morin is very well known in Germany, or Timothy Dick is very well known in the UK. In fact, uh, Timothy, Timothy Dick has a better rating on Twitter than the Queen of England for the first time. <laughs> so, all, all these people have been using uh, all the, the social network, the, the Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and we have promotional on the ground working for them. Because we, at the time of Pesquet when he flew, we had no Facebook in space. We had just a, a way to send pictures to the ground, and we had promotional pictures, and we could have YouTubers sending pictures every day on the social network. Communication. Communication is really important. And we still do it very well. So we, the, this is a, a very important question because uh, uh, about, ten, about 10 years, 15 years ago, NASA uh, did the whole project to go to the moon uh, with a new rocket, with a new spacecraft, and uh, with a new approach to the moon. And they went to see uh, Mr. Obama. They said, well, we want to go to the moon. And they explained during five hours the whole process, how to go to the moon, and everything. After five hours, uh, Mr. Obama said, well, very nice, but why do you want to go to the moon? So NASA prepared the whole thing of uh, how to go to the moon, but he didn't say why to go to the moon. So today, we, we have been working on the why, I and mean, I have my own why. We do the space station like the Mir space station to prepare the International Space Station. The ISS uh, is preparing the moon. We will have a space station called Gateway around the moon, which is much more economical than landing on the moon. From this Gateway, we will land on the moon sometimes when we, when we want, and the moon preparation will have to go to Mars. So the process is to go to space station, moon, Mars, and then asteroid. Asteroid because asteroid has a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, excellent uh, material, on asteroids that we don't have on Earth, so we need these materials on asteroid. And because also asteroids are dangerous, we have uh, two um, uh, extremely bad hits of asteroid every 50 years. So in the next 50 years, we show sure able to die, and some people will die because of uh, receiving an asteroid. So we have to go there, and in 50 years, we'll be able to land on the asteroid, put engines away, and put the thrust in order to avoid the asteroid to hit the Earth. So this is one of the parts. And at that point, you have to know that. Uh, the sun is like a, a boiling uh, part of hydrogen. This will uh, disappear one day in a million of years. We have to prepare the path of our children to escape from the solar system, which will become a uh, black hole, and to go to exoplanet. So the fact is, today we are on the path of going to space to go further and further, and I am sure that one day we will escape from the solar system to go outside. So remember, this is good for not only for NASA. When you do the, when you prepare the how, uh, you have to prepare also the why. Excuse me, when you go on space shuttle, yeah. did you go to EVA? No, I do not. I, I was prepared to do EVA because um, there was one scenario where we 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 tilt the space telescope to 60 degrees. And yet we had to push it with some uh, springs from the back. Is at one point we couldn't escape. I had to go outside to to un, un, uh, undo the telescope and to throw it away. Uh, I didn't have to do it, but I was prepared to do it if something wrong. But it's impossible to land with a space telescope uh, on the back because we have to close the below bay doors before landing. But I did the EVA training with the Russian, with my company, and never went out. 
But if yeah. you want to go to Paris for the sake, for example, of Lunar Plans, will you train all of you to land the space shuttle? The two persons that are able to land are the captain, which is a lady on my side, which is on the left side, and the pilot on the right side. So, um, Would you replace one of them? Well, I could, but, but I wasn't allowed because the backup of the captain is the, the pilot. They, they just are two persons. But uh, on the same time, I was the only pilot uh, spare of the space uh, vehicle because the two of them were engineers, so I could have been, but I was not scheduled to do it. But you were trained? Yes, I could, yes. I, I did training and I could land the, the, the space shuttle, the simulator, everything. Which is, which is not easy because the uh, space shuttle has to fly from 125 to, to 200 knots. So the CG is a satellite, the, the aerodynamical center is moving very fast, so it's very unstable on the pitch. It's no more on the wall, but very unstable on the pitch. So you have to be very careful because if you are not careful, you can induce what we call a PIO, which is a, a pitch induced oscillation. It happens in the first five flights. So when you have that, you just, you just don't touch the, the stick and the shuttle will itself uh, go down. It's a uh, fly by wire, fly by uh, electrical computers. May I ask, um, what do you think about space tourism? Do you think it should be more accessible to anybody? Well, space tourism is, is a fact. We started, as I said, with Tony in 2001, and after him, uh, seven other uh, private uh, people flew on the Soyuz to the space station, and then we have tourists with Virgin Galactic, with SpaceX, and with uh, Amazon. So there is a request for this number, there are a lot of money, and there is a future as well. And I cannot say it's, it's a bad future because each, each of these missions is bringing something positive to our background. When, uh, when the tourist flies in space, we will do some experiment which is different from what we do normally. So all these missions are useful for us. So I believe uh, that uh, tourism has a place in the future. And by the way, we have a, an association of uh, all of us, called ASC, Association of Space Explorer, I remember in the beginning we did not like too much the fact of tourism. Now we call them uh, space explorers or space uh, private explorer. But we decided to give the same umbrella to all of them. Even if you are a tourist or if you are like me, a government astronaut, you will get the pits of AC. So here is one pit which is going up and down, which is very negative, or one pit which is around, which is circular around the earth. We, we come there with, with, with us. We just don't separate them from the rest of the world. We just walk all together towards the same goal, which is going to the moon, going to Mars, going to the asteroid, and escaping the solar system. When do you think we will reach Mars? So Mars, uh, when uh, was uh, selected in 1986, it was, people said it's 30 years, and now it is already 30 years. The limit of Mars is radiation. We can send the vehicle to Mars today with some, with some robots to Mars, which is fine. But the problem is radiation are very, very strong when you go to Mars. And uh, if you are going there with no uh, uh, special protection, the maximum life of a human, human body is 45 days, or the flight is six months. The most complicated is the flight to Mars and going back to Mars. Once you are on Mars, you can hide yourself if you are on the other side of the sun. We have to escape the protons sent by the sun, which are very low. And we have no way to protect except if you take one meter of plumb uh, around the space which is too heavy. So we go to the moon to prepare the protection against the radiation to go to Mars. And to the moon, you can, you can do a 45 days mission, which is easy. But 45 days is maximum with no protection, with no serious protection. So, I would say in some years, but nobody knows when we get this protection. Uh, like said, Elon Musk, you go today or tomorrow, it's impossible. Just impossible because you die when you get there. Yes?
Well, um, I used to be a good friend of Mike Griffin. He was the head of NASA when I was at NASA. And he said, Michel, you, uh, uh, Bezos and uh, Elon Musk will never succeed to go to space. So he, they, they never believed uh, Elon Musk would succeed. But he did succeed. At the beginning, we did a very hard selection because we asked him to send a space to the space station during 10 years. And all of these missions were successful. And then, he sent the SpaceX Crew Dragon with people outside, with two persons and no four persons, and all the successful. The rocket is very simple. When you look at the rocket of uh, Elon Musk, it is kerosene and oxygen, like the Soyuz. So the engines are very easy to do. The only difference is that he is able to land the, the booster on the side vertically, which is very nice to see, but I am not sure it is very efficient in terms of money. So uh, it's successful. When you look at the um, SpaceX uh, launch, each launch is about 70 million. When NASA used to launch the space shuttle for 500 million. So, with a single SpaceX, uh, NASA is saving money, but SpaceX is also building a huge capital for many, many years because he's the only one able to launch people on the space station. Then we will do with a Starliner, but they are late. And uh, so, the, the plan of NASA is to leave the low Earth orbit for a kilometer to commercial people like uh, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, and NASA keeps the money to go to the moon or to Mars. And they have no money to go everywhere. So you save money with commercial company because that's the cost, and then you get this money able for building Orion. Orion is a new spacecraft going to the moon and also to the space station. So no more tricky question, <laughs> even simple question. <laughs> okay. so, so you are shy, you are a little bit shy. <laughs> but if you, if you can remember one thing uh, for you guys, I mean, in space is great, but uh, uh, you need, for the selection of astronauts, we believe at the time we were the best, but no, when we had this book, we said we are not the best. So remember, in a job, when you see something is going wrong, just don't hesitate to start again. Which is what we did. We did a new selection process, new quality for our school, new training, and people did not like it. I started to do this FDP with psychologists, and the astronaut said, we don't want to be seen by psychologists, because where is going to ranking of psychologists? The people were the guests. So you have to start again, and finally, all have accepted to do this sham FDP. And now we have excellent results. The same is, is for us. All the missions are six month duration, and there is no fight at all. When before that, people were flying in space, and uh, they were fighting manually, sometimes with knives, so it was difficult. But today, uh, we have a real nice atmosphere in the space station. Peace in space. Huh? Peace in space. Peace in space. Peace in space, and peace in space even today, because uh, a few days ago, a Soyuz uh, launched from, uh, from Baikonur with uh, three, Russian, three Russian on, on, on board. They had the yellow spacesuit, yellow and blue, which is the color of Ukraine, so it was very well seen on the space station. But if you think all, all the, all the color of the space are yellow and blue, so it's, we are all yellow and blue, but there are a big yellow on this, this station. But most important, on the, on the 30th of March, which is in the five days, six days, we land from the space station a Soyuz with inside Ukrainian, Russian, American. So, um, this means that um, even if there is a war on the ground, this is just a philosophical consideration, even if there is a war on the ground, in space there is no war, because we have to fight together to save ourselves against the crew, which is very dangerous, and the high level of temperature, which is plus 150 degrees when you are in front of the sun, minus 150 on the other side. So you have 300 degrees of uh, delta of temperature. So high level of temperature, high level of pressure. So this is behind the door, as we said, in space. And because of that, Russian, American, Ukrainian help each other in space. And even in the world, this space station is the only link of communication between Russia and America. So, 
Sometimes I believe that is really useful even when there is a war on the ground. Amen.